Right, so this section is on sums and quotients of vector spaces and I'm hoping that it will all be revision. But it might not be, and some of it, come to think of it, some of it will be a little bit more advanced and might need some discussion. I do invite you to look for more details in standard linear algebra textbooks if there's anything slightly unfamiliar or you're a bit rusty on or something like that. So let's have a look at what's going on here. So first I want to remind you about what I call external direct sums. We're going to have external direct sums and internal direct sums in typical algebraic fashion. So we'll have two different vector spaces over our scalar field F and we'll just define our direct sum, we'll just take U cross V, so ordered pairs and then we do the usual component-wise operations so that u1 v1 plus u2 v2 is u1 plus u2 v1 plus v2 and so on. The other one you need is scalar multiplication where you take your scalar and you multiply it by both coordinates. And that's your external direct sum. But now I want to look what happens if you've got different subspaces of a particular vector space, and under what circumstances can you define what's called the internal direct sum? And then we might want to wonder what the connection between them is. Can I just ask, is everybody familiar with external direct sums of vector spaces? Anybody not familiar? Not very familiar. OK. Well, we won't have that long to think about it, but uh, I'll, I'll just put the scalar operation in as well then. So lambda times uv is equal to lambda u, lambda v. So you can now see, this is where, remember, we're working on u cross v, and so you're talking about pairs of vectors, one from each space, and you add them by adding up the coordinates, and you multiply by scalar by multiplying each coordinate by the same scalar. You can check on the, all the properties of that, and it comes out. It's a very nice vector space just because u and v are. And obviously, the, the, the zero vector in the new space is done by using zero in each coordinate, and so on. I don't want to spend too long talking about that, so if you want to go and revise that from some linear algebra book, that may be useful. Um, it will connect up, though, with the following discussion of subspaces of a vector space. So here we've got some vector space over your scalars f, of course. And now you've got a couple of subspaces. Then it turns out you can always add the subspaces together to get a new subspace. It's actually the smallest possible subspace you can have, which has got both of the other subspaces in it. So we're looking for a, a linear subspace of V, which has all the things from E in it and has all the things from F in it. And what you do is you look at all the possible sums you can get by adding something in E to something in F. Remember, this time we're working with subspaces of V, so you can do that. Um, we're not doing an external sum, this is an internal sum. It's not a direct sum yet, it's just add together pairs of vectors, one from each space. And it's easy to check that this is a, a linear subspace and that it's the smallest possible linear subspace you can have that's got both E and F in it. As a result of which, you can call it the linear span of the union, E union F. Um, linear span is a set of all possible linear combinations of finitely many elements from a set. So, uh, so the linear span of a subset S contained in V, lin S is um, the set of all finite linear combinations of elements of S 
except there's a very slight issue of what you do with the empty set. By convention, the linear span of the empty set is the zero subspace. So that's a linear span of the empty set is not empty, but includes a zero vector. There are various rationales for doing this, but the idea is that really the linear span of S should be the smallest possible vector subspace of your vector space, which has everything from S in it. Now, the smallest possible vector subspace, full stop, is a zero subspace. So you always want linear span of something to be a subspace, so you've got no real choice with the empty set. However, one can argue that the empty sum is zero, and, and that the empty sum counts as a finite linear combination of elements of the empty set. So if one allows the empty sum as being a, a linear combination of things from the empty set, then you're okay anyway. But in any case, I will always have the linear span of something being a subspace. So, if, so I will follow the convention that the linear span of the empty set is zero. This is also convenient because you want this to be a zero-dimensional space, and you'd like to know what a basis for it is. And the basis for the zero subspace is, of course, the empty set, um, which has got... You want to be able to count the number of elements in your basis to say what your dimension is, and there are no elements in that basis, and therefore it's a zero-dimensional space, as it should be. Anyway, never mind. You can mess around thinking about those conventions. But uh, in any case, under most circumstances, I won't be taking the lin linear span of the empty set, and there won't be a problem. Now, something special happens if your two subspaces intersect in a trivial way. Well, of course, every linear subspace has got the zero element in it, or the zero vector, okay? Which I didn't underline here because um, we're sophisticated these days and we don't have to underline our vectors really. And then I was inconsistent and I underlined it there, but it doesn't matter. So if they intersect in a trivial way, the smallest possible intersection of two subspaces is that they both got the zero element in, but nothing else in common. Under those circumstances, um, these sums are sort of unique in as much as you can never get the same element in two different ways. If you did, you'd find quite quickly that um, you get a contradiction or, you get, uh, or that you've got a non-trivial intersection and so on. Uh, so having trivial intersection means that these things can e each of these sums arise in exactly one way and that makes it very like the direct sum that we had before, because you can think then of one of these sums as almost being the same as the pair x comma y, because the sum determines x and y when it's a unique expression. And that's one of the reasons, apart from the fact it's also vector space isomorphic to the other one, that we use this direct sum notation here, except it's called an internal direct sum. So this when the intersection f is just zero, then we can use this circle plus direct sum notation for the sum e plus f. And uh, we'll note here that the two different kinds of direct sum are isomorphic to each other. So that's isomorphic to the external direct sum. via the map xy goes to x plus y. It's rather difficult for me to tell you where the map goes from and to, since they both have the same notation but mean different things. Um, I guess I could write it as a map from E cross F goes to V, or E plus F. But this time internal. So this one is the external. And because, as I say, these x plus y's have got a unique, uh, are sort of unique in this setting, that you don't end up with two different ways to get to the same sum, this ends up being an, a, a vector space isomorphism between the two different kinds of direct sum, which is why we use the same notation.
but it can be a bit irritating, especially when I'm trying to explain it at the moment. Why is E plus F isomorphic to E plus F? Uh, right, now the special situation when, when you add them together and you get the whole space, V being the direct sum of these two subspaces. So if V is the internal direct sum of two subspaces, then we say each one is an algebraic complement of the other. So F is an algebraic complement of E, but similarly E is an algebraic complement of F, because it's completely symmetrical um, in this setting. Um, because x plus y is the same as y plus x. So uh, there may be subtle differences in the external direct sums, but there's no real difference in the internal ones. Um, so if you found that you, get, you end up with mutually complementary subspaces when this happens. Now here's something that's very easy in finite dimensions, but rather tricky in infinite dimensions and needs the axiom of choice. Is if you've got some subspace of a vector space, you might want to find a complement for it. In fact, you quite often want to do that. Um, that's rather difficult, uh, especially if you've still got infinitely many, if you've still got infinite number of dimensions left, then you've got to do quite a lot of work to find a complement. Now, unless you're in some specific situation where you can actually identify exactly what's going on, when you might be able to do it nicely, generally what you have to do is use Zorn's lemma and Hamel bases and start with a Hamel basis for your first subspace, extend it to a, um, a Hamel basis of the whole space, and then use your new elements, um, the new ones you threw in, to be a basis of your algebraic complement. So this is not an easy fact at all. But nevertheless, we'll assume it every now and then. So it is worth uh, thinking about it. And I've left it as an exercise. So. Uh, I think that goes on one of the question sheets, so I won't say more about it for the moment. Again, have a go at these exercises and make a list of the ones that you're struggling with and you can come back to me with those because uh, we can always discuss those exercises which are given trouble. So, Quotient spaces are one step more sophisticated than direct sums, I would say. So let's have a look at this. Um, it connects up with equivalence relations. So you've got a vector space and you've got a subspace, and we're going to want to form the quotient space. Now, this is connected to with equivalence relations in the following way. You, say, you can define an equivalence relation by saying that x is related to y if and only if x minus y is in w. Now this is easy to check, this is an equivalence relation. Um, obviously x minus x is 0, is in your subspace. x minus y in w means y minus x is minus that, is still in w. You can take minus of things in subspaces. And if x minus y and y minus z are in, then add them together and you get x minus z is in. So it's an equivalence relation. Now at least temporarily, let me denote the equivalence class by square brackets around x, but then it's actually the same as a translate or a coset. So you can figure this as translate or coset, depending on whether you're thinking um, vector space or group, um, of your subspace. And obviously if you take two different things in here, their difference, x plus something in w and x plus something else in w, the difference is in w, and so on. So these are all equivalent to each other, and nothing else in your big space is equivalent to x. So you can check the details of that. And now your quotient space is officially the set of equivalence classes, or the set of translates, or whichever you want to do it. But uh, quite often we will just use some other kind of letter for it and say, we've got a quotient space, and we're quotienting this out by that, and then we'll say a bit more about what's going on in that setting. But as I said, um, here are your, here's your quotient space, and here's how you add these equivalence classes together. If you add x to the equivalence classes of x and y, you have to take the equivalence class of x plus y. But you have to check that's well defined. In other words, suppose you take something else that's equivalent to x and something else that's equivalent to y. Is it true that the sum is still equivalent to x plus y? The answer is yes, because the difference, is, the difference ends up being in W, and you're OK again. 
So this turns out to be a well-defined operation. And the same goes for scalar multiplication. Again, if x1 is equivalent to x2, you want to make sure that alpha x1 is equivalent to alpha x2. But fortunately, the difference is alpha times x1 minus x2 is going to be in w. So that's well-defined as well. I find not everybody's happy with this notion of well-defined. So uh, when you attempt to define a function, you have to check that your definition actually makes sense. So it's not clear that this makes sense because it could have been that, to, that the same thing on the left gave you something different on the right, and that would not be, so then you would have failed to have defined a function. So that's the sort of check you do to make sure that your function is well defined. But again, if you go and look in books on linear, uh, any book on linear algebra, you can find all, out, all about quotient spaces. And it, it, you know, it's exactly the same kind of thing as in any other kind of algebraic situation where you want to take quotients. Now, the quotient map is very useful. And this is something we'll use all the time later in this module. I'll usually call it Q. Some people use, call it pi. It's a sort of projection because, of course, it does map onto everything in the quotient. It takes x to its equivalence class, which I'll write as x plus w most of the time. So it takes x to its translate of w. And that gives you a surjective linear map onto the quotient, and the kernel is just the thing you're quotienting out. And I think that would be a good place to stop today. We'll have a uh, we'll have a, a little bit more of a talk about what sort of things going on here next time.